Hi, everybody. It's so great to see everyone on um, our Zoom today. My name is Sierra Gonzalez, and I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to this session, um, How Can Arts Change the Game Making Change? This is crafted in partnership with the Community Arts Network, and we have an amazing group of speakers here to learn from and engage with, um, as well as some time to be active participants in a workshop as well. Just a few quick items before we dive in. Um, first, this session is being recorded and it will be released publicly after the event. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other and pose questions to our speakers. And on social, on social media, we're using the hashtag SkollWF. We hope that you'll join us online for the conversation. And after the session ends, please return to hop in where you can either join small group roundtable discussions in progress um, or one of the panel sessions that will close out the day's programming for School World Forum day one. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Werner Binnenstein Bachstein, the Director of Community Arts Lab and Porticus. Thank you so much. And I have the pleasure and I'm delighted uh, to welcome all of you to this wonderful session uh, as the representative of the Community Arts Lab and also uh, in the name of the Community Arts Network. And of course, we are very grateful that SCOL opens the heart for the arts, that's nearly a rhyme, but of course they have done also historically it very often with many partners, but still giving also the space in this main session means something and hopefully is also um, a beautiful uh, sign and symbol uh, about the value and the power of the arts. And actually, and that's how I want to start it, it's a bit strange and also schizophrenic that on one hand, art is all over. It's all the time with us in our daily lives. And it was historically always crucial. Nobody would, I think, uh, deny this in our national hymns, even now in the bomb shelters during this horrible war in Ukraine, in the COVID time singing from the balconies. You remember the Italian singers in all the revolutions like the fall of the communism. If we think about the Velvet Revolution, by Václav Havel in 1989. And in all social change movement, artists are present and essential, essential, like in the Black Lives Matter movement. So that's one thing. On the other hand, and that's the, the, the schizophrenic part, is we still really don't fully value it as societies. We have cut it out of our educational system. It's the last field really taken seriously by government and the fastest to be cut out. And we made it also a bit of a luxury in a sense of that's only that for those who only can afford it, it's a bit of a bubble thing. And even at least in the European context foundation, it's sometimes seen as the emotional one thing, kind of the add on an afternoon program if there's some money left over. Of course, there's a bit harsh and I know that the many US foundation and also ours are investing a lot into the arts, but still artists, not a luxury, it's the its essence and its core. And also because we are very much stuck at the moment with our traditional tools, tools and approaches, we do need new innovative instruments. And I say literally instruments. Why? Here are three um, referring examples of why referring to the three wounds of our societies. First, we are not connected to our environment not connected to our garden earth. That is why we have a climate crisis. And although we have all the research, science, latest horrible actually reports, past communication campaigns, still things don't really change. We have to address and communicate the topic differently and connect differently to our minds and hearts. Here art is most probably the best storyteller, I would say for new narratives we urgently need. It is a wonderful approach on the community level, but also on the society level, thinking, for example, about the role of artivists, like Olafu Eliasson, whom I do, and many more working on the ground. Second, we are not connected to each other, the social crisis. And this is essential for peace and essential for our endangered democracy, the eco chambers, the huge division in our societies. 
We do need glues, new bridge building approaches. Art is maybe the common basic language we all understand beyond words. Thinking, for instance, of community dance programs in Colombia, bringing former enemies together. It's, it's the most powerful bridge builder uh, we can think of. And thirdly, we are not connected to ourselves. The well-being crisis, if you want so. We all need to be seen and see into ourselves, looking inwards. We have to take care about ourselves, even if we are the privileged ones, to be strong enough to connect with others. We do need self-esteem to not compensate for our inner weaknesses. The mess we made in the world is for me a kind of mirror of our inner selves. This is tricky to solve, but we have to heal this first fast and urgently. Arts can help here to discover ourselves in mom uh, moments of wonder, awe, of deeper connections with our inner lives. For instance, when you go into a museum and you think it's all about just this beautiful picture, it's more about that you can discover yourself. If we take entrepreneurship seriously, it means taking risks, being courageous, passionate, going the new road, the new pathway, being co-creative, thinking out of the box, and all these big words, not knowing expertise, but learning curiosity, not being a knower, but rather being a learner. Art here can help us as a beautiful and impactful instrument to innovate differently, to innovate differently. Let us apply arts to its full potential. Let's dare and try this out together. It's actually not really a risk, I would say. The power of the art has been proven over centuries, thousand times in our history. Therefore, this session is also an invitation to join us and come along and be long together because we do need each other for all the challenges we face together. Let me end with a quote from Janet Winterson, a wonderful author and writer. She says, we do have an inner life and that inner life needs to have respect and needs to have some nourishment for itself. And that's why art can never be a luxury because if it is, being human is a luxury. Being who we are actually is a luxury. Life can't be about utility. It has also to be about emotion. It has to be about imagination. It has to be about things for their own sake so that this journey of ours makes sense to us and is not simply something that we are rather fretfully trying to go through another day, another week, another month. That pressure that we so often feel. And with these words, I'm happy to hand it over to Anis and I wish everyone a wonderful session. I'm happy that I can join this session. Thanks, especially to Skoy. Thank you very much, Vanna, for giving us um, the tone of what is going to happen in the next hour. So my name is Anis. I am the Managing Director of the Community Arts Network. And I will tell you about the flow of our time together. So what's going to happen? We'll have a conversation around art for making change with first a series of um, very inspirational speakers, as you will see, all bringing a perspective, their perspective to the questions of art for social impact, also all complementing each other. We'll have the opportunity to ask them questions through the voice of the audience that I will be monitoring through the chat box. So please feel free to use the chat box for thoughts, reflections, questions you may have. We'll then listen to the speaker's replies to the voice of the audience questions. And after, we will all play a conversational game that my partner in crime and friend Chaba Maniai will explain to you in a couple of minutes. But before jumping into the core of our session, let me introduce you to these wonderful speakers. Saba Chohan, Yasmini Arboleda, and Eric Booth. Unfortunately, Lucia Pietro Justi is unwell and cannot be with us tonight. Lucia is the wonderful founder of the General Ecology Network, as well as a thought after curator, notably for the Serpentine Galleries in London, also in the past for the Venice Biennale, as well as the Shanghai Biennale. We will miss Lucia, but we have invited a set of guests for our main course that will grow your appetite. Eric Booth is the founder of the International Teaching Artists Collaborative. 
He's been recognized as one of the 25 most important people in American arts education. Eric will enlighten us on what we mean by arts, artfulness, and the language around all these notions. Yasmani Armoleda is artist in residence, both at the Community Arts Network and at the New York City's Civic Engagement Commission. He's a true people's artist and always tries to make us see the artist that is, at least for my case, sometimes very, very deep in us. And Sava Shohan is the program manager, climate engagement at the IKEA Foundation. She will reflect on how a foundation can play a role in the arts for social impact world. Doing the serious work on making change needs everybody. And of course, without the support of sponsors and foundations, we are missing an essential ingredient in the ecosystem. All are exceptional professional and human beings. All are also friends, which make this event very special. And now let me give the floor to Chaba, the impact architect at the Community Arts Network, who will guide us through this session. Chaba, over to you. Thank you, Anis, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, the way we designed or imagined this session is that uh, we do have an idea to propose, but let's first start since Lucia can be here today with us. Uh, let me start with something she said during one of our preparation sessions. She said she was in a meeting once um, where her partner said uh, they were overjoyed to see her and that they really very much need arts and collaborating with arts. And that, that, that truly it is really time now and, 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 and they need a new cover for their brochure. And, and I can see how that happens. Uh, and that may happen, but we would like to change that because we believe art has a much more meaningful role to, the, to bring to the table. Indeed, if we ask the question why, despite our often heroic efforts, things don't really seem to change, especially systemically. Here we would like to propose an idea which along this line, which may help us to see arts and its potential impact in a different way. If I could please ask uh, you, Ashley, to put in that slide now. What, what we mean is underlying all the plans, solutions, projects, challenges, and in fact, connecting them all. Uh, there is a fundamental relational layer which is about how we relate, how we connect to ourselves, each other and the world. As Werner so beautifully explained, we do have this gap widening. We do have a connection issue, which is rather something that is unhealthy than uh, not operational. We desperately need those relational qualities like meaning, belonging, dignity, integrity, creativity, playfulness, caring in order for these solutions uh, uh, to work, for the project to succeed. If we keep relating in the same way, even if we try doing thing, different things, most likely we won't be able to solve these challenges. We can't achieve real meaningful change. But if we can change how we relate, then maybe in an emergent organic way, things really can change both locally and systemically. And what we argue is that there is not enough attention and conscious nurturing effort put into this layer. Uh, and that is where arts can come in because arts naturally and inherently can impact this relational layer. It can shape, heal and build uh, how we relate. And in this way, uh, art's impact becomes something that is not parallel, uh, uh, simultaneous, silo, and then either or which one to use, but a way to integrate with all our more other efforts and modalities of change. And with, with this introduction, I would like to ask Eric to, to partly maybe reflect on, uh, on this idea as, uh, as he shares his thoughts. Thank you, Chaba. 
Uh, and it's a pleasure to reinforce this idea introduced both by Chava and Werner that there's something about art that we're not quite getting, the power of it, and how there's this omnipresence, but it's also thought of as special and boutique and elite. The way teaching artists, and that's my field, artists who work in schools and communities around the world, and there we use different titles, there's teaching artists and participatory artists and community artists and artist educators, forget the semantics. The particular skill of this group is that they are dedicated to activating the innate artistry of others. And that's where the power for change lies. The capacity to awaken this omnipresent capacity that all humans have by birthright, their innate artfulness, not art apart, that creates a separation of there's an artist and I'm just me, but in fact, this innate potency of our own artistry, teaching artists activate it. And that is such a powerful instrument it can be channeled into change. As our commissioned artists around the world are showing, addressing climate change issues. Uh, that in fact, if you awaken that power through creative engagement and then channel it into a genuine issue that affects those lives, change begins to unfold. So we think of art as a verb. We love those nouns of art, we love making them, we love sharing them, and we know the potency of change lives in the verbs of art that are universal and that this workforce that I represent and am gathering is especially skilled at awakening in everyone else, and once awakened, guiding it into the purpose of our session, which is change. Let me pass it to my longtime friend, Yasmani Ar Arboleda. Thank you so much, Eric. It's a joy to be with you all today. I am joining you from Lower Manhattan, uh, formerly Lenape Canarsie Land. And I'm gonna share my screen to show you all. I'm a visual storyteller. Um, I have the privilege right now of being the artist in residence for the Civic Engagement Commission. And when Eric speaks about this, you know, how do we create space for art and creativity and imagination? to be at the decision-making table. I will tell you that in 2015, the city of New York uh, uh, created the PEAR program, putting artists literally into city agencies to transform how those agencies work. When I showed up in the middle of 2020 at the Civic Engagement Commission, which is just three years old, um, it's the only city agency that has a, a mandate to build trust in our democracy. And I will tell you that when I showed up to do this work, and to be the artist in residence, I realized very early on that nobody knew the Civic Engagement Commission existed. So a huge part of the work that I was meant to be doing was to tell people, hey, our agency's here and we're meant to be transforming the way people see government. Immediately, I understood that the Civic Engagement Commission, its name kind of gets in the way of the work. So I was like, shouldn't we be people-centric? Could we be, call ourselves the People's Commission? And then I started uh, experimenting and thinking about the possibilities of what it means to prototype in public. And the first thing that I thought of was, gosh, it means in this moment in 2020, when we're dealing with so many pandemics, all of the racial challenges that we're encountering in our society, how do we meet people where they are? Meeting people where they are literally meant, how can we have a mobile unit that we can go to people and meet them and ask them about how they're doing and how we can support their well-being? It takes four years for the city of New York to procure a bus. And my appointment was just for a year. And so I, will, I say that because it's important that we recognize that most of our institutions are not meant to be changing dramatically quickly. And many of the things we've encountered over the past few years have, have led us to, be, to understand that we do have to be prepped and ready to transform. So I ask, who are the chief transformation officers in your community dealing with all of the change that should be addressed as we're moving through so much change? So to make this work, I, I asked the Department of Corrections if I would be able to take a bus from Rikers Island and transform it into a beautiful community center because we were just beginning to learn in the city of New York how to do ranked choice voting. We took the bus and we went to all five boroughs and we asked New Yorkers, what should this bus become? Literally showing them, teaching them how to use the ranked choice vote, voting mechanism that they would be using in the, in the local primaries. 
this is what the bus looked like as it was moving out throughout the city. It was really critical that we consider not re-traumatizing people by showing them just the prison bus, that we were actually cladding it and beginning its transformation. We asked New Yorkers of all ages, uh, thousands of them responded to fill out a postcard where they could show, show us what the people's bus should look like. Um, and then I created illustrations. People wanted the bus to become a gathering place for people to share story and a stage, as many of most of our theaters were closed during the pandemic. Then I invited different community groups to actually come together and use millions of recycled beads to create the ceiling of the interior of the people's bus, which tells the story. Actually, all of the beading that you see in the inside that has gold is all of the sketches that were left by inmates who traveled inside of the bus because we wanted to preserve the history of that, of that particular bus. The bus literally changes color with sunlight. It becomes a rainbow. And here are 30 of the young people, the People's Fellows, the fellowship that was created to help transform the bus and to create the People's Festival, which occurred in 2021 uh, over a period of three months, impacting more than, uh, than 20,000 New Yorkers. Um, I should, it's now powered by uh, um, uh, uh, electric panels that we place in the ceiling. And this is what the mirror floor looks like, showing that 8.8 .8 million feet ceiling that represents 8.8 .8 million New Yorkers. Um, again and again, for me, the work is how do we, who are we, who do we have at the table practicing creativity and imagination and inviting us all to practice, gosh, what is possible given the constraints that we have, given all the difficulties, how do we make sure we can move forward and prioritize beauty and joy? Um, with that, I will pass it on to my dear Saba at the IKEA Foundation. Thank you, Yasmani. I'm not sure how to impress the audience after that. Um, wonderful pictures. So I think, you know, as, as somebody who's been working in philanthropy for a while um, and on climate for over 20 years, I have seen the power of art in changing narratives. You know, if you look at the history of how climate change and the crisis was communicated, the, the shift that this is really a crisis of our economies, our societies has been communicated by art. Um, I also have seen art transform communities and, you know, localize something that Yasmani just showed us. How do you localize change? How do you bring a complex issue like climate change to people's everyday lives? And how do you empower them um, through expression and through, um, you know, engagement and, and cooperation and collaboration to to have them be part of the change that needs to happen. And then finally, you know, art has, has the ability to give voice to the voiceless people. And, and I think that is important because when we talk about climate, which, which is my focus, we see that a large number of people who are vulnerable, uh, or sometimes we use, uh, you know, the forgotten populations to describe, uh, uh, you know, People who've been impoverished now, who are vulnerable, are not part of the climate story, are not part of the climate solutions, and are likely to lose. So there's a huge opportunity for the arts community and for artists and art activists to participate. And I think in it, there has been in the last few decades almost that's a missing piece. You know, art, artists have been willing, but not yet included. In, in, you know, in reimagining a post-carbon economy, reimagining the world, and also speaking up about the injustice which has actually caused this crisis. So um, it's about time that the climate community really engage with artists in a much more meaningful way. And, and just to say, conclude with, with some concerns that I, I have and some, some sort of ways that I feel in which philanthropy needs to reassess its, its engagement and its understanding of arts for change is that arts, culture, and politics are three areas where climate philanthropy has, um, and the climate movement generally has stayed away from. Um, and, and that has been largely because the solutions that have been given to us are technical solutions. Um, and our solutions that we feel, if implemented by high policy or elite policy, will be, you know, will, will lead us to change. But, but the solutions to climate change and the crisis we are in is unprecedented. And in that way, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how big or how much reinventing 
does art need to do to be able to really you know, match up to the crisis? Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, at this point, I would like to invite you guys to, I mean, a question, any of you would have anything to reflect on what uh, each other uh, said, please uh, do so. There is one thing that uh, I, I didn't want to ask uh, anything, but Yasmani, you said something in the preparation uh, session that was really interesting and I wanted to just ask in that direction. You said that it's not only about uh, finding art out in the world and try to bring it into our project, but, but there is something about finding the artist in ourselves uh, as, as, uh, and, and bringing that into the picture. And, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you so much, Chaba. You know, I often say this, which is people often ask the question, what is the role of the artist in society? And I often ask, my, ask everybody, what is the role of the artist in each of us? Because when I think about it, the, one of the resources that we're not really tapping into is our capacity for imagination and creativity is in each of our individual human bodies, right? Like, how are we practicing and engaging with that? And it actually makes me very intentionally think about the question when you think about your communities at work and within your families, in your neighborhood, who's in charge of practicing transformation and, and then inviting us all to practice transformation? How do we make sure that even when we think about budget lines, where, where is the value of imagination and creativity showing up in those budget lines? Are, is there, are there numbers we're dedicating to making sure that we are actively engaging with our own the expansion of our education and, and our mind's capacity to imagine the future with each other for ourselves individually, et cetera. So the role of the creativity and imagination in general, I ask, where is it? How do we find it? How do we promote it? Where, where are the dark spots where we're not really, you know, what, what's keeping us from activating all of these, all of these narratives in all kinds of spaces? Uh, I would chime in with uh, first a reassurance to the, our participants in this session. We didn't plan this, but do you notice how consistent the messages are across all of us who are speaking? There is this, uh, this plane of agreement that we're inviting all of us to take more seriously. This notion of where do the narratives change when the social imagination is activated. The term I use more often than art these days is make stuff you care about. And when we can activate the artistry, innate artistry in all people, so they are making stuff they care about in relation to a concern in their neighborhood, in relation to the way an environmental challenge is facing their particular neighborhood, this, uh, this looses the force that leads to change. And we were asked in the chat box, well, are there examples of this? There are hundreds of examples of this, but they are under the radar. This is happening around the world, but as Saba was telling us, philanthropy isn't well organized to make it visible or support it, but it is this sleeping giant that is awaiting our awakening it. Thanks, Eric. And, and I think, you know, what, what you said here was important in terms of also how do we, you know, there are lots of examples, but um, how do you, most philanthropies look for causation. So, you know, you, you did something and then something good came out of it and you have to track so that you can learn from, from what tactics and what innovations and what campaigns might work. And and is there something like this in the art world and can it be scaled? Because I think one of the things that most climate philanthropies are, are after is how do we decarbonize as fast as possible and how do we bring societies on board with a transition that is going to be unprecedented and, and also, if frankly, not, not very uh, you know, smooth and, and not we have losers as well. And, and, how do in how in that scenario when a lot of people have a lot of a lot to lose not from climate impacts but also from the transition how do they get represented somebody had said in the comments earlier that you know the art is sort of kind of an expression for also vulnerable people but we are not trying to you know i think of art as a political force to 
you know, show who is responsible for this crisis and hold them to account. And does, and I'm just thinking, is philanthropy brave enough to do that through art? Because it can be uncomfortable sometimes, but also like, you know, I guess my question to you is, where does art sit in, in this dimension of, you know, not just showing what's possible as solutions, but also to show where the real problem, the structural problems are in society and the power imbalances are that are actually causing the problems we are in today. Uh, there is actually one question I would like to uh, ask on, on, on top of this, because most often we think of art as a communicator. And, uh, and in that sense, it is, in, you know, that role is incredibly important. But are we only talking about that? Or there are other modalities where, where, where arts can come in, making people change as communities, for example. Is that, uh, is, is that a possibility or a role uh, for arts uh, to engage with? Any other place where it can be tangible and, uh, and you know, I'm talking really about uh, how can we integrate uh, arts in a meaningful way, not just use it as a separate uh, box. Uh, you're muted. That's like my middle name these days, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think you're setting me up to this for a, a, um, a set of ideas that I have come to discover in my work for when arts for arts for uh, climate crisis response that there are really three ways the arts have gone about trying to foment change to make powerful artworks that move people but they haven't really proven to be transformational in terms of changing the bottom line on climate crisis. They translate scientific information through arts media in powerful ways that scientists love. And it's a contribution, but it doesn't seem to turn the tide. Many artists get so frustrated, they head straight into political action to try to make a direct influence on systems and policy, powerful work. And ITAC is trying to draw attention to this fourth way, which is artists working directly in communities to activate that universal force of change, of creative artistry that all people have. And we think of that as a fourth way to address the climate crisis. And each one of those ways invites different relationships between art and other people. And I think we're just getting to the power of that fourth kind of relationship, which is I thou. Do any of you see good examples uh, of uh, where arts was actually working together with, uh, with other efforts, something, and any examples that uh, that come to mind? Well, if you if you broaden the definition of art and you, you know, include the work um, and the cultural shift that we are seeing amongst young people on how they are expressing what, what kind of future they want and how that has completely shifted the narrative on um, you know, what, what kind of the urgency of climate action and the need for the urgency is, is a very good global example of the influence that young people have had through expression. And, you know, I, that's, that's one of the, you know, my earlier questions that is, is would you say, and, and I think Eric had also talked about it, would you say that art is a good definition then to express all of that is happening with when individuals express themselves and ask for change and participate in change, does that remain art alone? And I think a very powerful example, like I said, would be the would be youth um, and what they've been able to do to move the needle on, uh, on governments. And, and I think a question for Yasmani on a local level would be, what was your entry point uh, for the city's project? Who invited you? Because we, we don't know where these entry points are. And, where they can really leverage change. So instead of uh, very boring uh, project language, what's the theory of change? 
when artists come in. And I think that's- Yeah, Saba. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to that question. And I will share that so much of what I've been able to accomplish within city government in New York has to do with playing tricks on the system, which is if the system doesn't expect the cap my capacity to think outside of what's expected, I get I, I can get through. But I'll give you another, I'll give you the example that's really simple actually. Uh, Tom Finkelpearl, who was the commissioner of culture in New York City in 2015, what, using tricks, created the pair public artists in residence program. And what he did was using a locations which are free for city agencies, it's called a micro purchase. You can do micro purchases of, of up to $20,000 and you don't have to have people bidding against each other for those contracts. And so using that $20,000, he said, if I give $20,000 to the Department of Culture and get other city agencies to give me another 20,000, I have $40,000 that can go towards these city projects that are led by artists that can happen every year. And that's literally what came to be. We're now operating a system across, I think right now there's been over 28 artists since 2015. There's four in, the, in four different agencies right now, but it's technically using a system that's made up of tricks something that's not expected that kind of gets through that prioritizes this way of thinking. And now I'm the becoming the first person to ever be actually hired post the program where the agency is putting an allocation of money for me to be there making decisions year round in relationship to all of the priorities of the agency. Uh, just because our, our time is short, let me call on you Anis a uh, little bit and, uh, and uh, just bring in uh, interesting thoughts, questions, comments from the chat, please. There have been a lot of messages, most of them messages of love sharing from the audience and how amazed they are about all these uh, discussions. Most of the questions have been answered um, by Eric, by Yasmani and by Saba. There is one that I have checked um, from Holly and Nadia yeah, at the same time. It's what is the role of art in nonprofits that are pursuing large scale societal change? And how can those of us leading cultural change within organizations embrace and use art in leading that change? And the question from Nadia, how do we put in motion this awakening? So if I want to reformulate, it would be uh, actually what are the barriers that you actually uh, experience from the artist perspective and from the philanthropic uh, perspective? And this is actually a good, interesting um, uh, segue because you all are looking for the others. So, so how can you communicate one and the other? Uh, well, I can certainly respond to the frustrations around philanthropy, which is a recognition that the work uh, that the community around the world that I work with falls between the convenient categories of philanthropy. Consequently, it is very easy to overlook, and that is why it is so invisible across the world, so under-supported, because it isn't convenient for the, the standard consideration procedures of philanthropic giving. Uh, I have found this extremely difficult to change over the last 20 years that I've been working at it. Um, I'm not dead yet, so there's still some hope that it can change. Uh, but the other comment I wanna make about the other question you raise is how to bring this work into the nonprofits. And it's through the Yasmani approach, the, the bringing the art in to disrupt the settled norms with unthought of solutions, with in fact whole fresh ways to reframe what the challenges are and invigorate them. But that's the matter of bringing that artist into the institution to contribute. Uh, guys, uh, uh, just uh, as again, I'm being mindful of time. Uh, I would like to ask you or invite you guys to to just do a, about a minute, minute and a half of uh, of closing thoughts. And if you have anything to add to these questions, please do incorporate those uh, in, in into those thoughts. And I'll go first so I can shut up, and I'll be I'll be short. Um, I invite everybody on this call to remember moments when you personally have been creatively engaged, when you have been in the flow experience 
of making something you care about. That's what we're talking about. That pleasure, that sense of satisfaction, that little bounce of energy to continue further engagement, that is the universal capacity we are looking to activate. It is not some woofy artsy thought to do that. It can be done. We have the skill set, and when we are given the opportunity, we can activate it and we can target it on intentional change. Yes, Mommy? You know, as I was hearing Eric, I was just typing this in the chat. Um, I highly recommend Adrian Marie Brown, both her emergent strategy approach, which is to be present and to have lessons from nature, all these different elements that really activate the imagination and creativity of individuals. But as I was hearing uh, Eric speak, I was thinking about pleasure activism and the, the fact that a huge part of my work within city government here in New York has been to think from the very beginning, I was like, gosh, we were throwing a big party that everybody was invited to. How do I make sure everybody knows they're invited and that it's gonna be a really good, like we're gonna really shake it down and we're gonna have really good food, right? Like what, where is the joy in every aspect of the invitation to participate in something? Because I'll tell you what, most people do not expect the government to be throwing a party. And so if we can begin to really shift our expectation of what the narratives are so that we can move towards a future that really welcomes everyone to participate, how are you each making sure that your family, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, everybody knows that you really want them to be present with this, with X? What is that, right? How do you make sure that you're activating the senses across all of our human capacity, not just, you know, not just writing, but everything else. And so we're going to be playing a game today. And a huge part of what we're, we're doing in, in the creation of this game is, gosh, where is the joy in every aspect of our engagement? When you're inviting people to show up on Zoom or in person, how are you making sure that there's something about the, the meeting that transforms even from the beginning? Thank you. I mean, this has been so inspiring. I think one thing that I would say from uh, from a philanthropy perspective, yes, the, we you, we haven't done enough to support arts and culture and use arts and cultural interventions for social change. And and part of that, um, I wouldn't say it's a lack of interest, but it's it's the lack of ideas that come, and and some of them are arts for arts. And if we have more ideas, more compelling ideas for arts for social change that you know, help us see how we connect the dots from arts to actual change, I think it would be really helpful um, in, in you know, bringing these projects um, uh, to funding. And, and, I, and I really i am very optimistic because um, you know, they, they, I've seen a, a real change in the last few years around people-centered um, participatory philanthropy and you know really bringing philanthropy closer to to people who need that and I think it's it's really important right now to for artists to find a voice and and you know people like Eric and Yasmani and Chava and Anis to show us how we can uh, you know design projects that are fundable at scale and, and at IKEA Foundation we are certainly looking for those projects as well. Thank you very much for all of you. And uh, when we come back from the game, we will have a few uh, more minutes to to close. But uh, really appreciate your thoughts and uh, and 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 being here. And uh, now let's not only talk about it. Let's uh, play with relating a little. Because if we if if we propose that uh, that that arts and artful thinking and an artful approach uh, may impact, heal, build, shape how we relate, then uh, let's try to see that a little bit in action. Uh, so I will quickly introduce to you two components, and then we build a short game uh, out of them. Can we please have those three slides to help me uh, explain how we, we go through that? Thank you. So first, uh, the wheel, uh, the wheel of art uh, we have been designing. I will be short about explaining them, but, uh, but happy to share if it's interesting, the deeper, uh, uh, deeper layers in it. We have been noticing that there may be four essential components of, of change. 
because we need to be able to imagine a different world, different solution. We need to be able to dream before our dreams can come, come true. We need to be able to see things differently and feel things differently because, uh, because we, we cannot really know something is important or at least that doesn't drive action. We can only feel it's important. And finally, the fourth element of movement because move, without movement, there is no change. And actually the way we see that, uh, that these four work in a sort of a cycle. If the four are there in synergy, then that is a full cycle of change where change happens in an emergent organic way. And all of these are about how we relate and how we can change how we relate to the, to the world. We designed 24 questions, four times six questions around this wheel that, um, that you will be able to use to spark interesting reflections and conversations to play uh, with, uh, with these elements or domains and drivers of, of change. The second component, uh, uh, if we can move to the next slide, is, is about uh, a triangle. Uh, it is partly about multiple perspectives and not just trying to see two sides of an issue uh, because moving out of that binary dynamics is important to really be creative and open uh, new horizons. But more importantly, we would like to invite you, uh, uh, you guys uh, to assume and play with uh, one of these th uh, three different roles. Uh, a role that mean rather a perspective. For the scientists, uh, we, we found that there is this attitude and, uh, and, uh, and perspective that could be described by trying to understand and find solutions. For the artist, it is about connecting and imagining, using our imagination. And for the alchemist, it is about transforming, making uh, things real, making things happen. Because just because we know uh, how to do things, just because we can feel things, it yeah, must be It's on sale. For, I just got the medium kind of, it's kind of a new brand for us, the Brazil. Sweet natural notes of hazelnut. Yeah. Where? Uh, it's, it's a, well, I got it. You can take oh. it. Going to... Sorry, uh, I was just uh, muted, I guess. So um, yeah, so the three roles and what we're inviting you guys to do to, to find this, uh, find one of these or all of these in yourself, in yourselves because they are all there in, in, in all of us and just play with it as much as it is comfortable. Uh, okay, and then Let's bring the two together into the game. Uh, let's uh, let, please have the third slide. So the idea is that, uh, that we're, we're going to have uh, conversations in threes, uh, in breakout rooms, uh, in about the theme or, or in the theme uh, of in our works of making change. Uh, and you will essentially get one question each and, and that uh, will give us a, a framing for the conversation. But going through the flow of it, first we will uh, um, bring you to breakout rooms of three. Uh, and we ask you please to select a note taker who can share the screen with the, with the others. Then spend about five minutes choosing a role, uh, each of you out of these three. It can be, we, who do you feel closest to yourself? Which one would you like to play with or explore? Just uh, playfully, easily, just hold this lightly. Then there is a, a simple digital uh, uh, tool, the wheel where you can spin it and you will see that uh, each of the roles uh, will get a question and what we're inviting you to do is to spend a little time, reflect on that question, uh, uh, sit with that question and visualize what comes up for you because drawing instead of taking notes is a different way of, of, uh, of thinking about it relating uh, to that question. And then there is that part where, where we imagine a conversation happens uh, along those three questions. Uh, every one of you could share their thoughts and, and the others reflect. 
and go that round. I know six minutes is very short, but this hopefully gives you a little bit of a taste. And, uh, and then spend a little time to share back, uh, share back with the whole group. If you can reflect on what's happened and just share not more than three sentences that, uh, that you would like to share with everyone. Of course, we won't be able to uh, see it in real time, but we will compile that and, and we'll share it uh, back with you. So you see what's, what's been happening. And Anis, uh, let me just bring you in to show you those uh, uh, two instruments or tools that, uh, that will be available for you to, to help you go through this game. Anis. Thank you, Chaba. Yes, we have prepared a few documents for you. First, a document that you can access from the link that is being put in the chat box right now. Ashley, if you can share the link of the Google document. And if you can share maybe the screen so everybody can see the PowerPoint. So you will have access to this link. Please click on it right now. You will have access to this Google Open PowerPoint and we will choose the breakout group that you are assigned to. From breakout group number one, two, now we are around 70, so breakout room number 25, 30-ish. When you are assigned your breakout group session, please go to the corresponding side Add your names in the document where specified, as you can see here. And you will discover on the top left side the Wheel of Art on a separate web page. You click on the link, you can have access from this group Google Open Point, Point document. We'll let you enjoy this half an hour or so, and we'll regather for a closing reflection moment. Enjoy your breakout session and see you in a while. Thank you. And uh, I would just like to say a, a few words in closing before our time is up. Uh, first of all, just, uh, just uh, two, two thoughts that, uh, that we were uh, talking a little bit about this and, and Eric mentioned that uh, what you guys actually experienced during these conversations were those verbs of art. Uh, that he talked about. This is really engaging uh, with with our artful or, or, or creative self, even if uh, if not necessarily through the direct uh, art creating action. And you were also part of prototyping this game. We were in the process of designing that, and uh, and we welcome any comments uh, or or any any thoughts about the experience or 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 beyond. So please share that with us. And, uh, and I would like to thank all of you uh, for being here with us and engaging uh, both through the, uh, the chat and during the game. And I would also love to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, I would just not go th through everyone individually, but, but you've been great. And, and thank you for all your th thoughts and contributions. And, and in general, uh, I hope that, that we have uh, managed to do what we, we said we would intend to do in the beginning and, and help bringing a new perspective on, on how arts could be part of the game of making change. And it is in some sense a call to action to engage uh, with and integrate arts more in meaningful ways more deeply meaningful ways. So thank you all for being here. And I would like to pass it uh, on to Lindsay uh, for a few technical closing logistical thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Baba. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this inspiring session. It's been such an honor to hear all of the speakers. And I hope you enjoyed the breakout rooms. Um, as we close, we'd love to hear what you thought. We're going to launch a just very quick one question poll and would love to get your feedback. Um, and after you are able to offer some insight into your experience, we'd love to see you back on Hop In tomorrow for day two of the Skull World Forum. And just grateful for each of you contributing to the forum um, by, by joining us at this session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You. Ditto. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Thank you so much. Can we find that wheel somewhere? I love the wheel. So cool. Yeah.
<laughs> we're gonna, yeah. You can find it online, but we're building a physical one that actually is where the digital one comes from. That is an actual game that will be physically in the world sometime in the near future. Can I buy it, what please? Uh, can I buy it? Yeah, uh, can I have an advance order? Put it, it on the bus. <laughs> I, no, I, lo I, I loved this. I thought it was like really, I wrote like I teach women's leadership and like I'm always looking for just like cool in person and virtually. And I'm always looking for just cool ways to engage people, especially like a lot of type A people who have trouble stopping and thinking about things like that. And I thought it was just a very beautiful way of not only like getting you to dream, but of contextualizing who you are and what makes sense for you. Like where, like I love the word, like where do you need to play? Because some of us are dreamers, but we can't get anything done. And some mm -hmm. of us are doers, but we, we don't allow ourselves to dream. And so I think it's that right. nuance of it is really beautiful. Plus like the wheel kind of changing the questions. I'm, I'm very impressed. I thought that was great. Thank you, Samantha. You're welcome. Thank you. And, and uh, we'd love to share with you, just somehow drop us a mail and then we'll, we'll solve it somehow. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Chaba. Thank you. Bye-bye. To all our panelists and speakers, we'll close the room now, but look forward Thank to you. seeing you back on Hopping. Thank you soon. so much. Thank you.